Amid an escalation of violence in with service and sowing Petro as a lead ahead of the turnout, Colombian authorities rule out postponing the presidential elections and explain how security guarantees will be implemented for the elections on May 29th. Spain's Ceuta and Melilla land borders with Morocco reopened on Tuesday after more than two years of closure. And clashes erupted in Libya on Tuesday as rival governments dispute the central administration of the North African country. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, from the Telesur Studios in Caracas, Venezuela. We begin with the news. Stay with us. And now we begin. Colombian authorities were allowed to postpone the presidential elections and explained how security guarantees will be implemented for the elections on May 29th. At a meeting of the National Commission of Guarantees on Monday, Interior Minister Daniel Palacios rejected allegations that the government is seeking to disrupt the process by postponing the presidential elections. Palacios said regarding security for next May 29th elections that the executive will prioritize the territories that show greater risk or specific situations to be prevented so that the elections can be carried out smoothly throughout the country. On Tuesday, the United States announced a limited easing of sanctions on Venezuela. Joe Biden's administration reported these measures regarding Venezuela the day after the lifting of a series of restrictions on Cuba. A senior U.S. official said that this sanctions relief of Venezuela refers mainly to a limited license granted to the U.S. oil group Chevron in the context of the embargo on Venezuelan oil imposed by Washington on Caracas in 2019. It is also announced three weeks before the ninth summit of the Americas organized by the Biden administration in June in Los Angeles and with Mexico and other countries in the region are threatening to buy cut if countries are excluded. And Venezuela made a statement following the announcement of a series of measures imposed by the U.S. on the country. The executive vice president of Venezuela, Delcy Rodriguez, through her Twitter account, Express. The Bolivarian government of Venezuela verified and confirmed the news published in this sense, that the United States authorized U.S. and European oil companies to negotiate and restart operations in Venezuela. In a second tweet, she indicated the world knows that Venezuela taking its first steps on the road to economic recovery with its own effort, denouncing and overcoming the illegitimate sanctions and the humane blockade. She stated that Venezuela hopes that these decisions of the U.S. will initiate the path for the absolute lifting of the illegal sanctions. She reiterated that the Bolivarian government, attached to its profound democratic values, will continue to tirelessly promote fruitful dialogue in national and international format. And the Venezuelan president, Nicolás Maduro Moros, asked the National Assembly to initiate an investigation on the statements made by the former United States Secretary of Defense about the plans conceived during the Donald Trump administration, together with Juan Guaidó, to invade Venezuela. Mar Esper. Mark Esper published a book of his memoirs when he was in the government of Donald Trump, and he wrote several pages about Venezuela. And he reveals there how Donald Trump and the bastard Juan Guaido plan to invade Venezuela. They made plans to kill me and the political high ranking of Venezuela. There are the evidences, and he declares it in great detail. Mr. President of the Assembly, I hope that the National Assembly will open an investigation into these serious revelations of Donald Trump's former Secretary of Defense. They spoke of an invasion of Venezuela. They spoke of using mercenaries from Colombia to invade Venezuela. They spoke of assassinating Nicolás Maduro and others. 
The Venezuelan president also denounced plans by the Colombian government to destabilize the, the Colombian country. government to destabilize the country during the meeting with the Council of Vice Presidents. In the fight against criminal gangs to neutralize plans originated in Colombia to buy criminals in Venezuela to throw bombs or to try to assassinate police and military, be aware, police forces. Minister Ceballos, be aware. Be aware, Padrino Domingos Hernandez Lares. Be aware, military forces, because Ivan Duque has conceived the plan and has invested several million dollars to hire criminals to throw grenades and attack military police centers with bullets, just like drug dealer Pablo Escobar Gaviria used to do against the police there in Medellin. The same is the plan to try to destabilize Venezuela. Alert it then. The Chilean government, under the recently elected president Gabriel Boric, decided to resume the militarization of the so-called Southern Macro Zone, which is the region of the greatest conflict between the state and the Mapuche communities. The announcement was made on Monday night by the Minister of Interior, Iskia Siches, at the press conference. The official justified the measure on the basis of an alleged increase in acts of violence on the routes crossing the provinces of Biobío and La Araucania. On March 26, the government put an end to the state of emergency that had been in place and in force in this territory since last October at the request of former President Sebastián Piñera. We have decided to use the tools of the state to provide security to our citizens, decreeing a state of emergency for the protection of the routes along the Arauco and Biobio provinces in the Araucania region to allow the free transit of people, supplies, and the implementation of policies that can improve the quality of life of the inhabitants of these territories. And on Monday, President of Guatemala, Alejandro Giammatte, re-elected Consuelo Porras as the country's attorney general, despite allegations raised against her both domestically and abroad. The office Yama will have all the support within the scope of our competence. We have been unanimously approved by the commission that evaluated the candidates. Porras has been at the helm of the prosecutor's office since 2018, when she was appointed by former president Jimmy Morales, but since last September, she made the U.S. government's list of corrupt officials. Porras was criticized for her decision last year to remove Juan Francisco Sandoval as the head of the special prosecutor's office against impunity. Sandoval is currently in exile in the United States due to threats made against the life in Guatemala. The public prosecutor's office will have all the support within the scope of our competence. We will strengthen that independence and autonomy that will allow the institutions to never again be used by national or foreign individuals who seek to impose a political or ideological agenda through selective criminal pressure. After the swearing-in ceremony, President Giammatte highlighted that the Attorney General Maria Consuelo Porras will have the support of the executive to avoid selective criminal pressure at the request of nationals or foreigners alike. And the group of mothers and relatives of the detainees disappeared under their dictatorship in Uruguay, warned of the lack of response to their cause by the state. On Tuesday, group member Elena Safaroni spoke against the lack of support to their cause by the government regarding the upcoming March schedule for May 20th. The claims there were about the approximately 197 victims silenced under the dictatorship of the former president, Juan Maria Bordaberry. 
Mr. Safaroni said the disappearances between the years 1973 to 1985 were part of the state terrorism characterized by mass detentions, but selective as well. Safaroni, a former political prisoner herself, said that the main objective of the movement is to find the disappeared. And members of the National Teachers Union of Ecuador went on their 15th day of hunger strike with a new sanctions to demand a fair wage. As explained by the union's president, Isabel Vargas, the hunger strike is one more measure taken by teachers to demand Guillermo Lasso's administration to deliver the budget for education, especially for the maintenance of educational institutions as well as the wage reform. On Tuesday was the 15th day of the hunger strike, carried out by 32 teachers from the cities of Quito and Guayaquil while they waited on a ruling by the constitutional court on the presidential objection to the organic law of intercultural education. The law establishes a salary compensation that increases the basic monthly salary for those who work as teachers from $1,817 to $986. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Morocco and Spain reopened their borders with Ceuta and Melilla two years after they were closed due to COVID-19 restrictions and a major diplomatic dispute. The gates opened shortly after 23 hours local time on Monday night, letting dozens of cars and queues of pedestrians pass through in both directions. The borders became the focus of a big dispute last year when Madrid allowed the president of the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic Ibrahim Ghali to be treated for COVID-19 in a Spanish hospital. This situation led to a diplomatic crisis with Morocco, which resulted in the change of Spain's neutrality regarding the conflict of the North African country with neighboring Western Sahara. Citizens on both sides welcomed the reopening of the border. Two and a half years have passed without seeing our families. We contact them only by telephone, but it's not the same as being with them. We have lost loved ones without being able to see them, and then in Morocco, suffer a lot like us. We are very happy to be able to come and see our families and our friends, as well as to feel the air of this country. Two and a half years have... And now we move on to other topics. Sweden's Foreign Minister Anne Lind signed her country's application for membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO, on Tuesday. During the signing ceremony of the document, Lind emphasized that her country's authorities decided to join the Atlantic Alliance after considering that it is in the best interest of the country, despite the constant warnings from Russia for considering the measure as a threat to its borders. And Linde said the application will be submitted together with Finland's and hopes that it will take up to a year for consideration and ratification of the document. The signing of the document comes one day. Prime Minister Magdalena Andersson reiterated, Magdalena Andersson reiterated Sweden's willingness to join NATO. On Tuesday morning, the Finnish parliament approved the Baltic countries' application for membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization by 188 out of a possible 200 the votes at the session. After a marathon debate lasting a day and a half, parliament voted in favor of NATO membership, a dramatic turnaround from Finland's military non-alignment policy dating back more than 75 years.
And according to the most negative scenario of the new macroeconomic forecasts published by the European Commission, the total cut of the Russian gas supply will sink economic growth in the Eurozone to almost zero and trigger inflation about 9%. The base scenario of the European Union for a growth of gross domestic product of 2.7%, more than one point below its previous calculation. However, this result will contract to 0.2% in an eventual supply of Russian gas. Likewise, the increase in prices, with the community authorities estimate in its new projections by 6.1%, will rise by three points and exceed 9% if the projections reflected in the spring macroeconomic forecasts materializes. And Russia's defense ministry said on Tuesday that more than 200 Ukrainian soldiers, including several dozen wounded, surrendered at the Azovstal steel plant in Mariupol. Yesterday began the surrender of militants of the nationalist unit Azov, and Ukrainian soldiers blocked at the plant Azovstal in Mariupol. Over the past 24 hours, 265 militants laid down their arms and surrendered, including 51 heavily wounded. All those in need of medical care were sent for treatment to a hospital in the city of Novosvosk, Donetsk People's Republic. And Russian authorities warn of the shelling of a village in the Kursk region by Ukrainian forces. The Russian Defense Ministry also warned that Kiev continues to engage in chemical warfare in the Donbas region. The governor of the Kursk region, Roman Statorivov, reported an attack in the locality of Alexiva. Statorivoit said Russian border guards managed to repel the attack and that three houses and a school were damaged during the attack, but there were no casualties. The Russian Defense Ministry also reported that Ukrainian forces detonated a landmine reinforced with a ton of ammonium nitrate near the locality of Mazankova in the self-proclaimed Donetsk People's Republic. According to the report, the explosion created a toxic cloud about a kilometer high. Authorities denounce that Ukraine resorts to these tactics to accuse Russia of the use of materials prohibited by the Chemical Weapons Convention. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. We are back. Clashes erupted in Libya on Tuesday as rival governments dispute the country's central administration. Fighting between army groups erupted after Fadi Bashaga arrived in Tripoli to take control from Abdul Hamid Dibeyev. However, Bashaga, appointed as prime minister by the Libyan parliament, left the capital hours later. To hand over power before the elections. For more than two months, there have been two governments in Libya. The government of national unity led by the Bayah and one of granted confidence in early March by the Tobruk based House of Representatives. And Mali's military junta confirmed it hindered an attempt coup last week, led by army officers and supported by an unnamed Western state. The statement read out on state television said a small group of anti-progressive Mali officers and non-commissioned officers attempted a coup on May 11th. In an unhealthy attempt to break the momentum of Mali's refoundation, a small group of anti-progressive Mali and officers and non-commissioned officers attempted a coup on the night of 11 and 12 of May of the year 2022. In his statement, the spokesperson for the Malian transitional government, Abdullahi Maiga, stated the attempted coup had the support of a Western nation, which he avoided mentioning. The country's military-dominated government has broken with traditional partner France and forged closer ties with Russia in its battle against the jihadists. These soldiers were supported by a Western state. The attempt was foiled thanks to the vigilance and professionalism of Mali's defense and security forces. As part of the investigation and the search for the accomplices involved in this disastrous project, the government of the Republic of Mali 
in forms that all the necessary means as well as appropriate measures have been developed, in particular the reinforcements of control at the exits of the city of Bamako and at Mali's border posts. In the midst of a serious crisis in Sri Lanka, the new Prime Minister, Ranil Rikra Masinje, said in an address to the nation that the country had gasoline only for one more day. The president said that the fuel shortage will be partially solved thanks to a shipment that arrived on Sunday and said that on May 18th and June 1st, two more shipments of diesel will arrive in the country thanks to a credit line provided by India. In addition, two shipments of gasoline are expected on May 18th and 29th. For several months, Sri Lankans have had to stand in long queues to buy gasoline, cooking gas, food and medicines, most of which are imported. This is because the country is on the verge of a bankruptcy and suspended payments on its foreign loans. At the moment, we only have petrol stocks for a single day. Another grave concern is the lack of medicine. There is a severe shortage of a number of medicines, including medicine required for heart disease, as well as surgical equipment. Payments have not been made for four months to suppliers of medicine, medical equipment and food for patients. The payment owed to them amounts to rupees 34 billion. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.